Morning. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about who we are and what, what this is and uh, what we're doing here and, and, and maybe later on we can get to why and that's going to be an interesting question because we ask ourselves that all the time. <laughs> but we are, um, as David suggested, you know, we're, a, we're an architecture firm uh, first and foremost but um, that has really changed over the years for us. Um, we, we are located in this building, so we're in a storefront right now, but, but we're a firm and, and we, don't, we aren't selling anything here. So um, our, we make our livings as uh, designers, as architects, interior designers. Um, we're doing some product design and exhibit design, experience design. So all, anything that people will let us design, which is increasingly a broad range of offerings, we'll do. And we're upstairs in the top two floors of this building. As you can see through the picture here, which has both our other partners, Jim Olson and Tom Kundig. There we are. Um, there's a few of us, so we're a larger mid-sized firm at this point. Um, but uh, this is something that has come to pass over the, the last few years. Um, the work we do is, uh, is pretty broad. We'll do everything from a table to a tower to a piece of hardware, and, uh, which you'll hear a little bit about later. Um, but we're also, you know, we're not a new firm. We're not a young firm, particularly. We're about a, almost a, we're a 45-year-old firm. We've been through a lot of different generations. And uh, we started as a pretty local firm, and now we're actually practicing globally. And again, working on everything from residences to museums, um, really broad kind of practice. And while we're kind of global in the work we do at this point, we're still really local in our roots. So I'd say over half of the work we do is local. And uh, as a culture, as an office culture, we're studio-based. and. Um, we're talking a little bit this, this morning. There's, there's something that's happened to, to workplaces. Yeah, I think despite the fact that we've gotten a little larger, you know, we're not corporate-based in the fact that you know, things don't necessarily start on high and go down to the staff. Yeah, everybody in our office, as an architect or a designer, you've got the ability to practice by yourself. You don't need to practice in groups. But everybody in our office is there because they see a benefit to working together and, and being in an environment with a lot of other creative people. And whether it's something that the office is sponsoring um, or things that they're doing on the, their own, it's pretty hard to find anybody in our office that isn't in the community involved somehow outside with arts or education or social services. So that's been a terrific um, kind of motivator for us. And it's an important part of how we practice. It, it, David mentioned the idea of innovation. And you know, innovation doesn't come when you sit there in a bubble. It really comes by reaching out and getting involved with people in the community. And as far as our community, we're here today in Pioneer Square, and I think there's people out in podcast land that aren't around Seattle, but <laughs> Pioneer Square is a pretty interesting place. It's a historic district, and um, we've been here for, we're in our fourth decade. Um, Jim Olson was kind of an early staunch urbanist and was pretty involved in, um, in helping reclaim the uh, Pike Place Market District, and actually he and his partners and some investors did the first new building in Pike Place Market in the 70s. So what we call the Pike and Virginia building. And shortly after that, he came down to Pioneer Square and he designed and built a building down here too, which was, again, the first new kind of contemporary building that had been built in Pioneer Square for a long time. And he's lived down here ever since. And, and, the, and that, was, that was happening before, um, before everybody was doing it. I think that you know, the, the millennial surge of people repopulating downtown areas has been fantastic. But it wasn't easy for the first people that did it. And Pioneer Square has always been kind of a challenging place, a fascinating but challenging place. Um, over 100 years ago, you know, this was a, a place where um, everything was happening. You had immigrant workers and sailors and people that are working on the docks, kind of sitting side by side with, you know, captains of industry and, and, tech, and, and people who were the sort of merchants and financial leaders of their time, kind of all here together in this really complex, layered space. And um, it's always been both the most glamorous and seedy part of town, together at once, I think. And uh, again, at the time Jim, Jim came down here, there wasn't, it, was, it was pretty abandoned when, when the first architects and lawyers that started coming down here in the early 80s came. Um, but, you know, today, it's probably the center to most of the, uh, to the, probably the greatest concentration of services for homeless populations. We have uh, two big sports arenas, which inundate us with crowds of people, there's tourism that's a big part of this, and there's nightclubs and bars and little restaurants and ma and pa. 
uh, commercial things that have been happening here and kind of an, an influx also of uh, high tech and uh, office workers, creative types. So it's been, it's been a, a fascinating place. You know, we've, other people have moved on to kind of cultivate other places and we've always felt like we needed to stay in Pioneer Square and be part of what keeps it going. But it's a fragile place. Um, actually, here's our building. Here's a part of why we stay here. There's, there's some wonderful, you know, old architecture. This is an over 100-year-old loft building, the Washington Shoe Building. It was actually kind of a new building for, for its building type, and you can see the top floors. This is iron construction, so they had big, big lofty windows, and there's a lot of things that, that keep us there. But like this building, it's like Pioneer Square. There's a lot of layers. There have been a lot of uses over the years. And this storefront, it's hard to imagine all the different things. We've done a little research, but this has been you know, many, many, many different things over the years. So that kind of idea of layering and change is very important to us. But, you know, in the last few years, the economic slump combined with, you know, raising rents and the popularity of coming back into downtown has made kind of a challenge for, um, for Pioneer Square and a lot of areas like it. We started to see more and more retail spaces become vacant. People who had low kind of margin businesses like galleries and small restaurants and mom and pa places were losing their foothold on being able to be here. And that really changes the urban fabric of a place when you've got vacancy when you, especially a place that kind of welcomes and tries to support homeless populations and, and tourism. You know, you need those eyes on the street. You need to have, you need to somehow populate the retail layer. And I think Jim was the first one who, you know, he walks from his home a couple blocks away every morning and, you know, had the notion that, well, maybe, maybe we, it would be fun to do something in a gallery. What could we do? And, you know, it was about a year. We didn't really know what to do with that idea. And we kind of pondered it. It was exciting to all of us, all the partners and everyone in the office. And then, um, suddenly, one day, we, um, a little bit of necessity paired with opportunity, and this particular space became available about at the same time that uh, we had made some commitments to share our space with people, and we, had no, we didn't have any space to share, so uh, Storefront was kind of born. Um, and the, first, the commitment that we had made that we were really challenged with was we had um, offered to share space with a studio of students from Washington State University who wanted to come. They come here every summer. They find a firm to work with and collaborate with. And we were really excited to have them here. They were going to do a project. Uh, they were going to work on a project that was a design project we were working on in, in Pioneer Square. But we had no place to put them. And then we thought, well, this is a wonderful space. We talked to our landlord and got a, a reasonable rate and thought this would just be a great place if you were a student to be able to spend a summer working on a design project. So we, we set up a little studio down here for them. And they were here with us for a couple of months. And while they were doing their design project, a lot of different people from the office would come down and tour with them or offer them, you know, sit in juries and, and do critiques. And we, we took some doors and some wood that we had around. And we sort of built them a studio. Of course, three or four of us sat and designed it and redesigned it and did the thing that we do. Um, <laughs> but largely, it was a pretty informal space. So that was, that was great fun. Uh, but nothing really extremely out of the ordinary. But another thing that was happening at the same time, we had a, a dear friend of the firms who we worked with a lot. It was Marianne Peters who is an artist and a, and a very conceptual artist, does a lot of public work as well. And she designs, you know, she, she's into spaces and environments. And we had given her that front little area of the space. She was doing an environment for us um, as part of a, a lifetime um, exhibit we were doing on Jim Olson's work at Washington State University, coincidentally. And so Mary Ann was here every morning, kind of, we'd, we'd given her that space to kind of do this exhibit. And so not only did she have the doors open and she was talking to everybody that walked by and really making friends in the neighborhood, she was also kind of collaborating with the students in the studio. And one day I remember being down here and, and being involved in a jury and the conversation was about texture and form and color and, you know, the things that architects can tend to talk about. And she kind of leaned around and said... And I haven't heard anybody talk about the history of this place all day, the stories, the people, the lives. And, you know, her participation as an artist with this design studio changed the entire dialogue, I think, of the rest of the studio. And it was at that point I kind of thought, wow, this could be really pretty interesting. Subsequent to that, we had a little time. We had a group of uh, people in the office who had won a grant to do some art in the park, in Pioneer Square Park. So we... Um, they were building uh, interactive seagulls that then hung in the park. So that was kind of, it was fun to be able to have that space, that kind of unstructured space. And then we got involved with, you know, we had the lease for the summer. We got involved with 
the Seattle Design Festival, which was, it was their first annual festival, and it's a group of, and I see a couple of faces in the crowd that were a participant in that, but it was a, it's all the professional organizations in town related to architecture, interior design, graphics, product design, kind of pooled their resources to do a series of outreach events for the community. And... Um, there was a particular exhibit. This is kind of the first time we'd really opened up the doors to the public and had a, an open exhibit. And um, this exhibit was called Dear Seattle. And we worked with uh, Studio Matthews. This is Christine, who was very involved, and her, and her collaborator, Cassie, and uh, volunteers from the Design Festival. And we, we built this exhibit that was about um, having a place that the community can come and weigh in and have a dialogue with Seattle as a place. There were interactive exhibits where families and kids could could kind of mark what, what their favorite places in town, what special places were, and also to, um, yeah, again, to kind of code and, and receive information. We didn't quite know what we were going to do with this information at the time, but there was also a place where you could, could leave a little note saying, uh, Dear Seattle, we've got to talk. I've got a problem. There was a place where you could have little woodblock messages and leave some little tips or suggestions for things that you thought weren't working. So it was, it was a great exhibit and people um, were very involved. It was fun to open it up to the public and you know our summer was over and we thought uh, well we should probably let go of the space but in the meantime we'd started making some friends and cultivating some ideas about what we could do with the space and that's when things started to get even more interesting. So a part of not everything that the storefront does or storefront Olson Kundig does actually happens in this space. And uh, this is one example. We have a bunch of small cultural grants that we give. And the idea there is that there's people in our community who are doing really sort of brave, adventurous work, and we wanted to support them. And we were wondering if a couple thousand bucks could actually change what they're doing and make it happen. Were any of you at the Red Shoes performance last summer, Fry Art Museum? Anybody there? You missed an extraordinary thing, and this is one of the things that we, um, we sort of help support. And by helping them, it meant that we could, it could become free and open to the public. So there was about um, uh, probably 1,500 people got to see this piece. It was, it's the Degenerate Art Ensemble, and they're an extremely unusual um, organization, and doing brilliant work, and, we thought, and so we wanted to support that. This was a migratory performance. It happened on First Hill. Um, and it had five different places where the audience moved and where different events happened. And they actually engaged in a building that we designed, the Fry Art Museum, and they actually used it as a pedestal to do their performance. So in doing this, we got to know them a little bit. And then we had an empty storefront, and so we had artists in residency. So we asked them if they would like to come in and work on some work right in this space. So uh, that actually happened. And this is Haruko Nishimura. She's one of the directors of the DAE. And she, when they were in this space, they workshopped a number of pieces that they wanted to do in other places. And they're a group that actually uses video, they use uh, costumes, they create their own instruments, uh, they pull in all sorts of partners to create their pieces. And so while she was here, and, uh, we actually worked on a number of different pieces together to possibly work on. So one of the things we discovered with Starfront was that we can actually begin some relationships with, these, with people and with artists that we can collaborate together with in the future. We turned the space into a theater, and there was four nights when they had performed a piece called Skirmish, and it actually started with them as the performers, but by the end, the entire audience was actually part of the performance. And then we also worked on shredding some ideas, and we decided we apply for a grant. And so we're in, everybody here probably knows about the next 50 celebrations, but for people in the podcast, Seattle is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the 1962 World's Fair, and there's going to be cultural events happening throughout the city. So we applied to do a grant where we would do four performances that would be the underbelly of Seattle Center. So the 1962 architecture, but the places the public isn't supposed to go, and that's where we're going to migrate the performance. It's going to involve video and puppets and projection and music, and um, we're pretty excited. And we won a $30,000 grant together, and we're going to create that piece. So come back in the fall and keep your eyes out, because I think it'll be great. We also continued a sort of collaborative relationship. So that, that's a definite outgrowth of what we've been doing here. This is a performance that they did, and we designed this uh, kinetic table for them. And it's basically unfolds. It's, a, it's the fourth dancer in the piece. It moves with them. It's a musical instrument. It's also a prop. And it was at the Barishnikov Theater and, uh, last weekend where it was performed as part of the anniversary performance of Robert Wilson's Einstein on the Beach. 
We also have a chance to actually work with people who, other people in Seattle whose work we really believe in, and Arts Corps is one of those. And I'm gonna take a quick poll. How many people went to public school in the room? So almost everyone. Uh, because you're a creative community at Creative Mornings, I'm a, I'm, my assumption is that the art classes that you took in public school and art teachers that you had and the music classes pretty much um, helped form the reason that you're actually in a creative profession and probably sitting in this group this morning. But in the state of Washington, only 40% of the students get about one class a week. So imagine what your life would have meant if you didn't have those experiences. Arts Corps actually goes right after that. They're taking real artists, practicing artists, and they're putting them in the classrooms. And that's work that we actually really believe in because every single person in our 100-person firm can actually track the reason we're upstairs to experiences we had as kids in, with art and with drama and music and so forth. So one of the things that we do when we do a collaboration externally is that we ask them to actually, in, we ask our, our collaborators to engage with our office. So every Thursday we have a design crit, 4.30, our entire office meets to sort of talk about design ideas. But we actually engage, and in this instance, how hard do you think it is to get 100 architects to actually do modern dance together? <laughs> and it's a challenge. But that's a tribute to how great these teachers are and what they can do. We also had exhibits of, the, of both the students and the, the teachers who were actually teaching, so there was an installation here. We had a number of performances. There were kindergartners who were playing um, Brazilian drumming and singing Portuguese songs. We had breakdance high school teams that came into the space. Uh, there was uh, visual artists and there was performances that happened throughout. We took that. We were fascinated by the programming aspect of it, how that tied in. So we opened up a record store as the logical next step. And this is how it begins. The crit that I was talking about, we invited uh, Sandra Jackson Dumont, who is a force of nature, uh, who is now here at the Seattle Art Museum doing extraordinary work. If you've been to Remix, 2,500 people book that you know, weeks in advance. Uh, go, if you haven't been, go. It's amazing. It's one of her many things she's brought to Seattle. We asked her what she would do in this space, and she, said, she looked at it, it was empty, um, and she said, I'd open, I think we should open up a record store. I think we should bring people together around vinyl records and get a lot of different communities to cross-pollinate and see what happens. So what happens next is we put a design team together. It's all for sort of the architects and the volunteers upstairs, as well as we bring in builders and contractors that we work with, and we create a work party. It usually takes about two days, and we built these kinetic parts and pieces that we could use to make a record store. Then we had to find records, so we found two collectors. This is Bernie Hall in the center, and Bernie loaned us, uh, he's uh, in the central district, he loaned us five decades worth of his vinyl collection, over 2,000 records that we could actually use and play in the space. The other person that loaned us a collection did so posthumously. He died of AIDS in 1991, his name was Stephen Ward, and his lover had his collection. And so Stephen Ward's collection, which was, a, Stephen was a Capitol Hill artist, and we had a DJ from uh, Chicago come in, and she looked at Stephen's collection. Her name was Lady Dijet, and she said, I can tell these guys spent a lot of time at the clubs. There was <laughs> extended Sheila E. disco versions. There was, um, so it was these two worlds, these two collections that were actually kind of great. What we wanted to have happen is we wanted to bring people together from a lot of different communities in Seattle that do not usually mix it up in the same space, and that was one of our goals. And we wanted it to happen around music and listening, so that was the challenge. There were times when there were hundreds of people in this space, so we had listening parties almost every night, and sometimes it was a party, and it went on for hours. But there were other times when Sandra programmed uh, curators who came in who, from all walks of life. We have urban planners, we had um, dancers, artists, uh, 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 activists, spiritual people. And all, what they did is they had to use the collection, they had to use the 3,000 records, but they spun their own stories in doing so. We had two holistic healers who actually used the collection to tell stories about sexual healing. So that was their subject for the night. We also, during the day, we were open uh, for four hours, and it was, it's an open lunchroom, but we had listening stations. Anybody could come in and actually grab records, sit down, put on some earphones, and play. And what was really beautiful is there were people who had never heard a vinyl record before, or the whole ritual of taking it out of the sleeve, the hiss of the needle hitting the album, staring at the graphics, reading the liner notes as you heard the music in the way the artist intended. 
We're not saying it was, it's better than an iPod or, or a version. It's just a different, it's a, it's a different ritual, and we, we wanted to recreate that. There also was the aspect of just looking through records and finding your past, your parents' records, something you saw at your grandmother's house, or something you'd never heard and always wanted to. With that, and learning what we learned from the many different groups of people that came to this space, we set up our next experiment. The next experiment was, and again, I'm sure it seems extremely logical, yes, we should open a mushroom farm. <laughs> and so we did so by asking, we wanted to ask a question, and we partnered with City Lab 7 on this project. And basically, they had theories about urban agriculture and sustainable um, uh, agriculture in cities. So basically, what we did is we went to the three coffee shops in our neighborhood. So uh, Cafe Umbria, Zeitgeist, and Starbucks. And we said, we want you to stop throwing away your coffee grounds because we want to grow gourmet mushrooms on them. And every day, we collected and ran these buckets up to our neighbors, and we brought them back. And we sent them up to Bellingham to Alex's. And Alex is a mushroom farmer. And he took the coffee grounds and he inoculated them with mushroom spores. Could we grow mushrooms on coffee grounds? Could we do that in this space? That was the question. And we loved that it could fail. Like we did not know whether we would succeed. We then began, again, we're a design firm. So we say, well, one of the things we offer to our partners is we can design with you. So we have the work parties that we had talked about and we design a space. And what we needed to do is we needed to design a, uh, a greenhouse because we had to control the humidity. So this is going to be a really quick video that's just going to show you um, the work party. All of the materials are donated. They are all second use. The, the, this is form work from concrete that we actually cut. Um, we have contractors we work with uh, all the time, and they volunteer and work with the architects to help build it. And in this case, it was Shukart Dow. And so you see it sort of coming together and uh, taking form, and it was this sort of orb that we worked with, and Michael is in the back, and he helped design this. And then, oops, we have to take it down and reset it up again. We built it backwards. So <laughs> this is the final step, covering it, spraying it in place, voila. We had a greenhouse. The experiment began, and then a couple of weeks later, it took root. We got our first mushrooms. Part of what we were doing was we invited people to come in, and it was a very zen moment, sit in our greenhouse and watch mushrooms grow. <laughs> but the beauty of it is mushrooms, grow. once they start to grow, they grow fast. And so a mushroom you were watching one day was going to look really different the next. We also have a community lunchroom, and we do this almost all the time now. Anybody in Pioneer Square, if you're down here, bring your lunch. 11.30 to 1.30, we're open. Come in and have lunch with us. People come from all over. It's just sit down and talk and hang out. But we also program some of those lunches. And these are about 25 uh, folks who are de dedicating their lives to or or organic farming and to sort of agriculture in cities. We also had a lot of mushrooms. So we had harvest dinners. We had 200 pounds of mushrooms. And so we had harvest dinners to sort of celebrate the end, but also to sort of talk about other ideas and to bring in speakers and, and have different series and so forth. So that was a, a sort of really great part of the project. You are all sitting in our latest installation, and if you were here yesterday morning, this space was practically empty. So these things come together fast, and we're sitting in the hardware store. And hardware store is, is basically we're compelling people to look closer, to look closer at the details and the tools and the hardware in their own lives. And so we're paying homage to a number of people who have really done significant work um, in relationship to Seattle and hardware. Hardwicks, for example, the Hardwick brothers jumped in. You've all been to Hardwick's hardware store, eight decades in Seattle, and uh, they've uh, donated parts and pieces to us. Phil Turner is someone who we do our kinetic architecture pieces with. He's an engineer, but these are the things that he collects and surrounds himself with. The Galassa brothers, the same story. The objects there are the things that inspire them to be sort of creative in the work they do in relationship to hardware. There's, we're going to finish this. We're in the mid-installation, you can probably tell. This is going to be an exhibit about how to create a, pro, a hardware line. And we're, it's a, Tom Kundig has just uh, uh, produced his first line. And we're going to have an event, so I want to invite you to all to that event. 
But um, it's basically going to be how to, how to go from sketch to having your hardware in kitchens in London and, and the process of selling stuff online. So if you're designers and you're interested in that, um, on the 26th of April, we're going to have an event here. And there'll be uh, tickets at Brown Paper Ticket. It's free, and we're going to have beer, but we're limiting it to 50 people. So if you would like to come and have Tom uh, hear him talk through how that happens, uh, we'd love to have you come back. The last is the community collection, and a bunch of you did this, which is we asked people to send us pictures of hardware from all over the world, and they have be begun to trickle in. We have about 40 more. A bunch of people in this room today sent us images. We'll be printing them out today and adding them. That's going to keep growing. If you see pictures of hardware, send your picture to hardware at olsenkundigarchitects.com, and we're going to build that over the next six weeks, and that wall is going to grow and change. So it's been um, pretty amazing to have this much extra space. And, and I think uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why we think you should do this. But, you know, how we justified it ourselves was we thought a little bit of it's like if everybody in our office had a yoga mat and came down and rolled the mat out and all the edges touched, it pretty much fill up the space. It wasn't that much extra space per person when we thought about it. But you don't need that much space either. And I think um, this is something that, that's happening actually upstairs in our office that has the same set of philosophies. And it's called the ledge. It's... Uh, Seattle's smallest, hippest art gallery. It's actually um, a ledge in a um, uh, wall between um, Jim Olson and, and Jerry Garcia's workstations. <laughs> and this is something that's, uh, that's programmed. They act as the directors of that. And they program a different artist comes in and does an installation every month. There's, there's the ledge there. It's, it's, it's that what you see. That's an opening party. We get about 30 people in the 10 by 12 foot uh, workstation. And there's some of our artists that have come to do installations. They come, they give a little lecture. You know, we have some wine. It's very nice. And people can, you know, people that are in the office, they go down and they check out the ledge. What's going on there? So here's a, one of the exhibits in the ledge from Matt Browning. And another one, Katie Stone. The names are on these as you're looking in Podland. But it's very fun. It's, it, it, it gives us something that... It, that um, gives us something new to look at every, every couple of months. Here's the current one that we have in place. This is a work by Claude Gervais. And this is actually paper. It looks like big, heavy pieces of wood that have collapsed from our ceiling. It's actually, it's actually made out of paper, so it's quite wonderful. This is an installation that's upstairs right now. It's a drawing machine. It's been drawing for three months. It's uh, by Mark von Rosenstiel, an artist that we connected with. Um, and it's responding to the daylight coming through the skylight. So it's doing a drawing of where the wall is getting the most light. And uh, if you were to, upstairs right now, it's slowly drawing a line to show where the light is. Next. We also occasionally, um, uh, there's two exhibits that are here in Washington right now that we think you all should go and see. Um, we obviously are... Um, really opposed to censorship, as I'm sure almost everyone is. And uh, Hide and Seek was an exhibit that was uh, banned at the Smithsonian. But the Tacoma Art Museum had the courage to bring this exhibit, and it's the only installation in the Pacific, in the regional Northwest where it's go, uh, gonna show up. We, want, we helped support them in bringing this exhibit here. It's an amazing exhibit. If you haven't seen it, go to Tacoma. It's really great. And another kind of long-term partner we've had is the Wing Luke Museum. We've done design work with them, and they reached out to us. They had a small exhibit that they wanted to um, put on, and they were having a hard time raising money around it because it was a video-based installation, and that was sort of difficult for them. Uh, but but it's, a, it's about the relationship between um, the art and graphics, animated graphics that occur in video games, and that relationship to the drawing um, relationships to Asian culture and how those things combine. That's basically where we are so far with the storefront project. Where it will go next is, as you can tell, is, some, is somewhat iterative in relationship to the people we meet, the things that overlap. We're probably going to keep going in here through 2012. That's basically our presentation. We love your questions, um, if you have any. Well, that's interesting. I think we'll answer it in two parts. First, uh, oh, okay, right. Uh, so the question was, how do we promote our events and activities? Do we rely on foot traffic? And it's kind of an interesting story. I think um, Storefront has given us um, some ideas about some new ways to do things. We now have a Facebook page. We didn't, as a firm, have a Facebook page before. So Storefront Olson Kunig Architects exists. That's one of the, the many ways. So in, in a way, it's allowed us to kind of roll out some new things we were hesitant to do on our own. 
I think the other part of the answer to that question is we put out a press release for everyone. We have uh, we publicize it on our website. We um, and then we uh, our marketing director is here, Matt Anderson, and he has a number of connections in media. So we make people aware of the projects, and some of them have had a surprising amount of interest. The mushroom farm, for example, just went. Um, kind of crazy on the internet, actually. Um, New York Times covered it and things like that. So it was actually um, really surprising to us because uh, we had no idea. You can't leave and, oh, there we go, good. Uh, do you have a set of criteria for what it is that inspires you? You know, what it is that you're going after? I think um, the question is, do we have a set of criteria that inspires us in terms of what it is we go after? And I think uh, Kirsten and I are the co-directors, and I think we have different answers to that, so I'll, I'll hand that one off. But for me, the thing that it interests me, and I think the, reason, the thing that we want to convey to every person in this room is that what we're doing is replicable. Every one of you can do this in your own organizations in some fashion. You saw the ledge. You saw how small it can be. And the thing that interests me is creating a cultural context that you can actually create in unexpected places. So you don't have to rely on a museum or an exhibit or a gallery or, or some sort of bona fide institution. You can simply make it yourself and see what happens. And so in that regard, um, the person who's inspiring me the most at the moment is Theaster Gates, and it's his Dorchester projects in Chicago. And so if you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with those, take a look at what he's doing with buildings in dangerous neighborhoods and, and installations and creating new kinds of cultural places. And that's where I'm hoping Storefront goes. And I think we don't have a lot of rules about what we can't do here, and we really try to be open and think about what we can do, but I think the best things that we get out of it happen when, first of all, we're, we're trying hard not to sell anything, really. I mean, it, it, we've had in-office critiques about we could do this, we could do that, and inevitably someone says, we could make some money if we did this, and we kind of go, eh, you know, it feels like the thing that we don't want to do with this particular space, it, cause it, and it constrains us, and we have clients, and we have objectives. I mean, it's really been nice to kind of let the thing evolve. And um, another th great thing that happens, is, as Alan's alluded to, when we have program partners, things happen in here that we couldn't design. There's no way that the record store and the kind of things that happened in it during that period of time, or Mushroom Farm, could have happened without the program partners that we have. So that's another aspect. Um, we do like to have a design participation. Not that we wouldn't ever give a space to someone and say, design something and we'll watch. But for the most part, that's been a really big part of our engagement, is the design interaction we have with, with people doing programming or other designers. So that's exciting to us. And, and we also like the, to have the ability to have whatever we're doing really engage people in the office, to give opportunities for them to have that, you know, a design experience or a construction experience or some programming opportunity that they wouldn't have otherwise. So it's about trying to kind of connect all of those dots. And a lot of things do, and they do it in different ways. Uh, the question is, uh, has there been reciprocity in relationship to um, experiences that we've had here that inform the rest of our work? Um, and the answer to that is yes, definitely. We're, um, when, you when you collaborate on an inst installation like this, it, um, it changes your, your sort of collaborative relationship. So almost every one of the, the people we partner with, we have other ideas that we're trying to generate with them. So um, it's created new possibilities in that regard. Um, and, so, and there were a couple of examples that you saw. But we also, um, like this particular exhibit, we have an exhibit design division upstairs. And so uh, there's the ability of telling stories and narratives that we get to sort of hammer out because we're doing, an, we're doing a different thing in here almost every six weeks. So we get, just get to shake it out. And because there's only like a couple of weeks to put it together, we can't overthink this. We can't overspend it. It, just, it has to happen. And honestly, it happens in a, a matter of days when it actually all comes together. So in those regards, I think yes. Yeah. So the question was, you know, what are some of the logistics around doing this? And I think it's an in interesting question. Um, it's a little loose, and we like it that way, which is it's kind of interesting because I would say that the practice that we have is not 
I don't think we're creative, but we're not terribly loose. I mean, we've got clients, we've got schedules, we've got budgets, we have high expectations. So everything is, is you know, cranked up to a pretty high volume with the work that we do. But this is a little different for us. This is something that's choiceful. We don't have a client that has, there's a little bit of financial investment in the space, but not a terrible amount. So we have a certain latitude to experiment and let the thing evolve. But that being said, Alan and I pretty quickly realized that we were overwhelmed with even just the small tasks of scheduling this, et cetera. So we did kind of put into practice a, 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 a method where we assign an individual for each kind of a point of contact, a project manager, I, I guess, for lack of a better word, to sort of be responsible for a particular exhibit and create a little task force around that. So. Um, a lot of, so that person, you know, we're, and we're, we're paying them for the time that they do that, but a lot of the rest of the work is volunteer. We do it after hours, and um, people seem willing to generate that. So to this point, it's been, it's been manageable. It's been really wonderful when we have program partners that also bring their volunteers to kind of keep the space open, and we're open very few hours, and we do rely on volunteers to keep that open. So that's, that's been an important part of keeping it going. I think that... Um, if it got to the point where we needed to hire a director or something like that, if it kind of spilled over what we could do personally, that, that's going to be a point at which we really say, maybe this starts to look different. So our goal is to kind of keep it to a level where we can kind of handle it and it's fun. And, and as Alan said earlier, it's, we don't think we're going to do this for 10 years. It's, we're going to do it while it's fresh. We're going to do it while it's fun. And it's going to probably evolve into something else. Um, and, and so we're kind of leaving ourselves open to let it evolve and to close it down when its time is done. But did I answer all your questions? Okay, great. Maybe one more. Yeah. Is there a project in particular that you're especially proud of perhaps because of the special message that it had or that was especially challenging to get? The question is, is there, is there a project that uh, we're proud of in, in terms of, uh, and, or, uh, in terms of the things that we've created here so far. And I think the answer to that one is we're planning one that's going to be happening in July. And so it's, you know, it's the one that you're excited about that's going to be the next one. And it's actually going to be about poverty and homelessness in Pioneer Square. And there are about seven or eight individuals or organizations who are doing actually remarkable and innovative work in relationship to addressing those issues. And we want to highlight that, and we're going to do it in a variety of ways. And we had a meeting yesterday with a couple of folks from different organizations, and I'm unbelievably excited about it. it. It relates to values that are important to us, but they're stories that have not been told and that people probably are not aware of. And so that element is really exciting. And there's going to be um, a cross-pollination of different groups of people that meet in here that usually are never in the same events or the same spaces. And that's another thing that they were pretty geared up. We want to thank every one of you for starting your day and coming into our space and checking us out and coming down here. Um, uh, stick around and, and chat with us if you can. And, and thank you very much for inviting us to come and be part of your podcast. We appreciate it.